I don't know why I came here tonight. I've got a feeling something ain't right. I'm so scared in case I fall on my chair. And I'm wondering how I'll get down the stairs. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Yes, I'm stuck in the middle with you, and I'm wondering what it is I should do. It's so hard to keep a smile on my face, losing control. Yeah, I'm all over the place. You know what? Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle. All right, yeah. So when we lived in San Antonio, we had a season pass to our local amusement park. One of the things we loved to do was to go to the uh, the musical acts. There were some great shows, great music. One of our favorites was the Vinyl Countdown. It was uh, featured one hit wonders from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, packed with some great music from artists that had that one song that would, was made a name for themselves. That one song would be forever embedded in history. And Stuck in the Middle of you, with You was one of those great songs. But the way they performed, they performed as a duet where this, this couple was kind of singing to each other. Right? There was, they were this couple that was surrounded by the jokers and the clowns, but at least they had each other. But that's not really the message behind the song. Jerry Rafferty, the, the author of that song from the band Steeler Wheel, uh, he wrote the song about the people who run the music industry, those record executives and people like that, the clowns and the jokers. And he, and he was writing about his, him and his uh, partner, musical partner, and how they were kind of feeling trapped, kind of caught between trying to make a livelihood for themselves and also trying to express themselves musically. And so they found themselves stuck between these record executives trying to churn out some more money and their arts. And so it was a difficult thing. That's a difficult thing for many musicians and artists who, who want to really express themselves but are also trying to, to make a living. They felt stuck, stuck in the middle. And have you ever felt stuck? The, the clowns on one side and the jokers on the other, afraid that you're going to lose control and uh, you're about to fall off that chair and down the stairs and trying to keep that smile on your face but you're looking like you're, you're looking to uh, losing control all over the place. I bet you, I bet you Titus felt that way, stuck in the middle, stuck between the clowns and the jokers, surrounded by liars, evil beasts, and lazy buttons. Perhaps feeling trapped or frustrated, wondering what in the world he'd gotten himself into, and uncertain how he's going to make it through. I mean, he was living on the island of Crete, a beautiful <laughs> island in the Mediterranean. But he wasn't sunbathing or drinking Mai Tais all day. He was there for a mission. He had a job to do. He was there to help recruit and train and develop quality church leaders that could lead the church that he was going to, to plant there. Leaders that had great character and also encourage all the believers, the Christians that were in those towns to be people who are devoted to good, to, so that they could draw people to Christ. And Paul, his mentor, wrote him this letter to encourage him, to encourage him to be devoted to good. And over the past few weeks, we've explored this letter and tried to unpack what it meant, what it means for us even today to, to be the people of God devoted to good. Paul wanted Titus to remain faithful in his calling as he was surrounded by these liars, beasts, and gluttons, to live as an example and to lead others as an example. He wanted to encourage the, the believers in that area to be submitted to God and to each other, to live self-controlled lives, and the, the Christian leaders to, to be found by the quality of their character and not the quantity of their skills, all of them being empowered by the Holy Spirit so they can do the work that God has for them, that they can remain devoted to the good calling they have. Today, Paul continues to want to offer Titus encouragement. 
when he feels stuck in the middle, when he's living between the godlessness and godliness, when he's stuck between worldly lust and righteousness. So Paul writes this to Titus, he says, deny godlessness and worldly lust and live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age. When we find ourselves trapped in the middle, or stuck in the middle, trapped and confused, surrounded by jokers and clowns, we're scared we're going to fall on our face. Paul wants us to know that being in the middle is right where we're called to be. And I'm sure you've felt that way before. I'm sure you felt stuck, stuck in the middle, caught between who you are and who you long to be. Maybe you thought being a follower of Jesus would just open you up to some amazing opportunities, possibilities for this rich and powerful and meaningful life. But over time, it's not like you've lost your way. The trappings of the world feel overwhelming and, over, and overpowering. You find yourself stuck in the middle between godlessness and godliness, between worldly lust and righteousness. And we, we want to live in this sensible, righteous, and godly way. We, we want to do what is right, what is godly and true. But the forces at work in this present age are powerful. And these forces of worldly lust and godlessness are, are, are just always after us. And we desire to be, remain faithful, to be devoted to good feels almost impossible. And every week, uh, through times, we get hit with this phrase to be devoted to good. And it sounds like a grand idea, but we're stuck in the middle, day to day, trying to survive. <clears throat> and so being devoted to good, living sensible, righteous, and godly ways, it feels like it's easier said than done. Sure, maybe Paul, this, this stalwart apostle, this titan of faith, he could be doing this. He, he could live sensible, righteous, and godly. He seemed practically perfect. But the truth is, Paul wasn't. And he understands what it means to be stuck. He understands what it means to, to live between godlessness and godliness. He writes this to the people of Rome. He says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. You feel like that? You ever feel like that's how you are? Or I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. How many of us can just totally relate to that? We want to do what's right, we just don't do it. Paul understands what it means to be stuck in the middle, to have a desire to follow God, to do what is right. But he's constantly being pulled down by the, the clowns to the left and the jokers to the right, stuck in the middle. Not sure what to do. Why is that? Why is it that we, we feel like we're stuck in the middle and we continue to struggle at doing what God wants us to do or being who God wants us to be? Well, the reason is that we are actually living in an in between time. In what Paul calls this present age, or we might refer to as the church age, where we're at right now. We live in a time that's sandwiched between two appearings, as Paul's going to say, appearing of grace and appearing of glory. He writes this, that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. And he goes on and says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So you see that there's, there's the appear, you can circle that one, and the appearing. So there's these two things that are happening, right? And we're living between these two, between the past and the future. We're living between the appeared and the appearing. We're living between grace and glory, between salvation that has come and a blessed hope for which we wait. It says that grace has appeared. Grace has appeared that the Son of God has come to earth. 
But Jesus gave up his divine privilege and he became one of us. The creator became the creation. The word of God took on flesh and he lived among us. And while on this planet, Jesus showed us who God was and what God <laughs> desired for us. Jesus taught us how to live the way God desires for us. And how he showed us how to die, to die to self, so that we could truly live for God. And Jesus showed us how he was willingly able to lay down his life. And he takes on our sin, our shame, all the things that keep us from knowing God. And he offers us grace. He brings salvation. It is by the grace of God that Jesus appeared. And through that appearing, we are saved. We are rescued from the clutches of sin and the punishment of death. Because of Jesus, the grace of God has appeared so that anyone, all who call on his name, find salvation. Paul writes in Romans, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. The grace of God is available to anyone, all who call on the name of Jesus. Salvation is there for all. It's not just for the rich and powerful, not just for the, the righteous and holy. If we look back at who Paul was writing to and what he was writing about just earlier in the chapter, we see that salvation is available to the old and to the young, to male and to female, to slave and to free. Grace has appeared. Salvation through Jesus has arrived. So what? But still, we, we are waiting. We're in a time of waiting. Salvation has arrived, but we are waiting for a blessed hope, the day when we will be fully redeemed. Paul explains that there is a, a second appearance, a blessed hope, the appearing of glory. He writes, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and cleanse us for himself and people for his own possession. This appearing of glory might be what some refer to as the second coming, when Jesus will come again, the day when Jesus returns, when God's promises to us are fulfilled and that blessed hope comes to fruition. It's a, a future day when we will fully know God and we will be fully known. When Jesus appears in glory, we will be fully redeemed. Now, talking about this second coming can be quite tricky because there are quite a few different theological interpretations that seem to sometimes contradict each other. We talk about eschatology, dispensationalism, rapture, tribulation, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. You're like, what the world are you talking about, Dave? Right? There's all these terms and ideas and ways of interpreting scripture. There are many different ways to understand what might be happening. But the truth is we really don't know what's going to happen at the end. The problem is that most of these perspectives are conjecture. They take some scripture and they try to understand, but we're never really going to know until it happens. Jesus told his disciples they won't know when he comes back until he comes back. Right? The sign for him coming back is his return. We hear about other signs and we say, oh, there's wars and rumors of wars, but wars and rumors of wars have been happening since the beginning. Right? We won't know what the second coming will look like until it actually happens. In the pursuit of trying to understand the end times, a lot of people try to 
to, to try to figure it out and try to assume, well, this is when this has happened. This is what this means in history. And this is what, and we really just don't know. It's like me telling you exactly what's going to happen in the upcoming Indiana Jones movie. I heard there's one coming out, right? <laughs> I can just tell you exactly what's going to happen. I haven't seen it, but I know there's some characters in it. I know there's a plot of some sort. Uh, but the truth, like, the only thing I know is that Indiana Jones is in it, right? So the only thing we know about the second coming, the real, the main thing we know is that Jesus is coming. We don't know when, we don't know exactly how it will be, but people put so much energy in trying to figure that out. Because they're trying to, to, to make sense of it for themselves and try to uh, put it all together. Well, all we can say is that someday, somehow, Jesus, a blessed hope, will appear in glory and will lead us to full redemption. But where does that leave us now? Well, we're living in between. In between the past event and a future happening. In between appeared grace that brings salvation and appearing glory a blessed hope that leads to full redemption. We are living in a time that many theologians would say is the already, not yet. Jesus has already come. Grace has already appeared. Salvation is already available. But things are not yet fully revealed. The blessed hope has not fully been here. The glory of God is not yet fully appeared. And when we're living, when we are between these two appearings, well, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to, to live? How are we supposed to function in that? Well, there are going to be two options of you. You can be stuck in the middle, or you can be living in between. You know, one of the things I like to do when I go to the beach, you stand there with the water's coming up, you just like stand there, let the, the water wash over your feet, and slowly your feet get buried in the sand. The longer you stand there, the more entrenched you become. You get stuck. It's kind of fun to do that at the beach, but oftentimes we, we can plant ourselves in our lives and we can get stuck. We get stuck in our old ways of doing things and we begin to lose relevance. We lose our witness in our changing world. Our traditions can become sacred cows and our sacred cows can become golden calves that lead us to idolize and lament the passing of the good old days. We might blame other people and their, their activities that keep them from church. We think that if we just stay put, then maybe they'll come back. We don't realize that they, would go, they found a community. They found a family and a, a, a place of acceptance that's outside of the church. Because it's not our culture, it's not their commitment that keeps people away from God. It's our stuckness. We forget that we're living in between the appeared and the appearing. We forget that we are called to lead people from grace to glory. So Paul compels Titus. He says to be eager to do good work and to proclaim these things, to encourage and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. He wants his protege Titus to be fully invested in what God is doing in Crete and beyond. He knows it's overwhelming and unpredictable. And when things get rough, we have a tendency to get stuck. And so he wants to give him some advice. Because those who are stuck in the middle, first they are afraid. But those who are living in between are unashamed. They're stuck in the middle or afraid they're going to say or do the wrong thing. We live in fear, so we do nothing. 
you say nothing. I know I've done that. I know that I felt there are times where I should say something or do something to care for somebody, to tell them about Jesus or, or to take care of a need that they have. And I was too afraid. Fear keeps us from fully living in the in-between. Fear keeps us stuck and ashamed. But Jesus says that we're in uh, John, First John says that there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. So that the one who fears is not complete love. We shouldn't let fear control us to keep us from loving others. Those who are stuck in the middle are afraid to love. But those who are living in between are eager, excited, passionate about doing good works. They're passionate and excited to show the love of God to others. They have the appeared grace in their lives and flowing from their lives to people around them. And they're unashamed to extend love and grace to others. But of course, wait, wait, wait. But if we, we do that, if we extend grace to others, are we just accepting their wickedness? Is that what we should do? Well, no. But being stuck in the middle oftentimes leads us to complain, while living in between leads us to proclaim. Those who are stuck in the middle find themselves complaining and griping and, and looking around at the world and seeing how awful things have become, but offer no real solutions. They lament about how things were so much better in the good old days. Were they really? Were they really much better in the good old days? Look at that. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is talking about how nothing has really changed, that the world is just as bad as it was before, and it will continue to be bad. And complaining seems just to be a way of life for those who are stuck, because it's easier to complain than to proclaim. Those who are living in between are proclaiming these things, encouraging and rebuking with all authority. This, this doesn't mean we're going to go out and start calling out people and rebuke. You know, we don't grab that word rebuke and say, oh yeah, I'm going to go rebuke people. Right? Jesus, that's not what Jesus wants us to do. Remember, Jesus came to earth and think about the people that he spent time with. People he, he loved and was hanging out with. The people that uh, he was rebuking were the religious people who were telling him not to hang out with these sinners and tax collectors and all these other people. But Jesus, who came down in all authority and proclaimed the good news, then he told his disciples, he said, all authority has been given to me, and now you go out, you proclaim the good news, you make disciples, and this is how you do it. Bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free. When we live in between, we're proclaiming the authority of Jesus in people's lives. We're proclaiming to the lost that they can be found. When, but when you're stuck in the middle, you resign. But if you're living in between, you shine. When you're stuck in the middle, you just maybe you want to give up. Just let the world be as awful as it should be. I remember when I was younger, uh, there was a we had something with the people at my church, and we we're talking about littering for some reason. One girl was like, Well, don't worry about littering. Jesus is going to come back soon. Like, um, I don't think that's right. Um, but there's so many people that just think, Oh, we just isolate ourselves. We let the world go about its business, but we'll just keep a safe distance. But that's not what Jesus did. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. He told his uh, followers to let their light shine, not to hide it under a bushel, not to hide it from people, to let it shine out. Of course, when it's, we're feeling stuck in the middle, we want to keep it hidden. 
for those who are living in between are, are letting it shine out, letting Christ emanate from their lives. So that we can live that life that Jesus has called us to, so that people can see Jesus and they will praise their father, his Father in heaven. Because the grace of Jesus has appeared, bringing salvation. This is that good news that we worship with every Sunday. And then the blessed hope that Jesus will appear in glory is that future hope that we have. We don't have to be stuck in the middle, afraid, complaining, and resigned. We are to live life to the fullest, living in between, unashamed, proclaiming, letting the love of Jesus shine out from us. The great thing is that the song actually got something right. It says, stuck in the middle with you, which means we're not alone. We talked about this last week, that God has given us the Holy Spirit living in us. He's given us a Christian community to work together in, to go out and to show his love, to be devoted to good. He gives us the courage to be unashamed. It's not our own strength, but his courage, his strength, his words to proclaim. It's not our words, it's the words of God coming through us. And it's his light we're shining. Throughout this letter, Paul reminds Titus that we are to be devoted to good because grace has appeared and glory has come. As the people of God, we are not to be afraid, we're not to complain, we're not to resign. God has called us to live, to live in between. As we prepare for communion, I want you to, to remember that. Remember what Jesus has done for us. And as we're living in between and we're devoted to good so that we can lead people from grace to glory. Amen.